we zoom in on a small enclosed space. A dark womb-like space with walls of metal. Where a small figure lies curled, appropriately, in a fetal position, waiting to emerge as if he were the main character of a show about to be born. Uh, metaphorically, that is. He's fully grown. Who is he? Oh, my arm. Well, you'll find out soon enough. Where is he? Well, it's pitch black. You can't see. I can tell you this much. He's in a dark hiding place. In one of the most famous buildings in the world. In Paris. <sighs> and it's a tower. And he's hiding while nearby. A large audience files into a grand ballroom to see the performance of a live radio variety show which is about to be broadcast. Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, you are listening to the orbiting human circus of the air. But what is he doing? Oh yes, he's pretending to be on that radio show. He does this. He does all the voices. Right now, he's pretending to be the host, John oh, thank Cameron. Thank you so much. It's going to be a wonderful show tonight. Oh. Oh, don't worry. This isn't what the show actually sounds like. Jacques, Pierre. Now, he's pretending to be backstage. He's pretending to do the voice of chief stagehand Letitia Saltier. She runs the show. That sounds nothing like her. Oh, good lord. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now Thank he's you. doing host John Cameron again, back on the air. That was the orbiting human circus orchestral performing its version of... What are you doing? I'm dusting the microphone. There he is, doing himself. Ah, oh, get away from the microphone. I'm sorry. I just thought I should clean up the show a little bit. Get off! Ooh, oh. Yes, even in his fantasies, he ruins everything. Why? Well, it does make them more realistic. Because that's what he actually does. He ruins everything. He's actually preparing to sneak into that ballroom, sneak on stage, and bumble onto the air, where a person like him certainly does not belong. Not in a medium known for intelligent discourse on important subjects like science, news, and technology. Good lord. For example, there must be something else on. Hi, this is Drew Callender from the Orbiting Human Circus, and on behalf of the whole Orbiting Human Circus gang, we'd like to welcome you to our first episode and thank our sponsors, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans and Adam Tickets. We are very happy to have Rocket Mortgage as our sponsor because for many of us here at the Orbiting Human Circus, Applying for a traditional bank loan would be nearly impossible. I, for instance, in my normal life, am a vampire, and were I to try to go out to my bank during normal business hours, I would turn into something resembling the dust that collects on all those piles of rejected mortgage applications. But with Rocket Mortgage, you can apply for a mortgage from the comfort of your own coffin or couch, whatever's easier for you. And you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button, so you don't have to search through stacks of old files and paperwork. Which is good for me, since I've got paperwork that goes back to the 80s. The 1880s. So if you, too, find it difficult to make it to the bank because its employees are always fleeing from you screaming in mortal terror, or for whatever reason, then check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com OHC. That's OHC for Orbiting Human Circus. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Use the Adam Tickets app to buy tickets and concessions, invite friends, and skip the box office lines. When you use the code OHC at checkout, you'll get $5 off your entire order through the end of the year. Download the free app, that's A-T-O-M, Tickets, from the Google Play or Apple App Store. And now, please sit back and enjoy... Episode 1. 
Now, see how much fun you can have with ventriloquism? So let's go on with our lesson. When talking for the dummy, speak in the front part of your mouth with the tip of your tongue in back of the upper front teeth. I find some students have a tendency to form their words back in the mouth. This gives a garbled effect like this. <coughs> and so forth. Now, it should be up in front, of course, like this. I had begun to wonder just... Absolutely, but... What is this noise? Listening to the radio. Trying to listen to the radio. Dad, go downstairs. Turn it off. In the grand ballroom at the top of the Eiffel Tower, the red velvet curtains part, and suddenly the giant on air sign above the stage lights up. Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the orbiting human circus of the air. The orchestral starts us off with its version of Chopin's Here I Snore, May I for Hours More. Featuring guest vocalist Romika, the extraordinary singing song. And so the Saw's song rings out, filling the ballroom at the top of the Eiffel Tower and out into the night, reaching radios. Radios. Radios the world over. But there is one lonely soul who is not listening on the radio, nor is he watching from a seat in the broadcast ball. At the back of the stage, behind the singing saw, behind the shimmering backdrop, to the left of the props closet, tunneled into the brick wall beside the fuse box, a heating duct. And curled deep inside this heating duct, claustrophobic and alone, hides Julian Janitor here at the Eiffel Tower, who secretly dreams of being on the radio. Oh my god, I'm so excited. I can just get a little bit higher. Oh, I can see. Twice ejected from the broadcast ballroom already this week for disrupting the broadcast. Oh, look out there, it's so beautiful. He now prepares to sneak onto the stage once again. I gotta go in there, I gotta go in. But that's just what he oughtn't do. You see, once inside, he can't seem to keep off the air. Look, right next to the vent, there's the catwalk. I'm just gonna go up on the catwalk and I'll, I'll hide behind the curtain. I won't say a thing to anybody, I swear to God. But that catwalk, it's rickety and old. It won't hold you. They're dimming the lights. I'm gonna go. Quiet. I'm gonna open the vent. But... Someone has fallen onto the stage from a great height, and is there a medic? I'm all right. I'm all right. It's Julian the janitor here at the Eiffel Tower. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you all right? Oh, I'm okay. Uh, uh, did you say something about the orchestral? Well, I was just about to pull the blanket off its cage. Spotlight, please. It's a bird. Thank you very much, Julian. Moving right along. The orchestral is a rare African bird. They can play all 46 instruments in the orchestra at once. But aren't there 47 instruments in an orchestra? Orchestrals choose not to play the viola. Wow. Thank you, Julian. Listen to that tiny piano. Thank you, Julian. What are you going to feed it? Thank you. Thank you so much. And now a word from our sponsor. We at Samuel Saws are proud to say... On stage as the commercial rolls, chaos... The broadcast having suffered yet another janitorial interruption. And with the whole world listening, and it is... The of the air is now the most listened to show on earth. Why? The whole world is listening to hear the extraordinary acts. Miracles! 
impossibilities. They aren't listening to hear the janitor be tackled and bodily removed by host John Cameron, which luckily they cannot hear due to the wisely timed sponsor announcement, which is about to end and return us to the live broadcast. The leading instrument in all of today's popular music. Saws are flying off the shelves of hardware stores into the hearts of millions. You are listening to the orbiting human circus of the air. Please explain, Professor. We've developed a machine that will allow us to hear the cricket song exactly as heard by the crickets themselves. I have a specimen here. I am now turning on the machine. Well, here you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the cricket song, heard for the very first time by human ears exactly as heard by the cricket itself. But as the little cricket sings its heart out on the air, there is one person who listens not on the radio, nor from a seat in the broadcast ballroom. In fact, he is not listening. Curled in a ball in the janitor's closet in which he lives, lies Julian, janitor of the Eiffel Tower, crying. I'm not crying. Mr. Cameron seemed very upset this time. I know. I think he was trying to strangle you. I know. He only wanted to strangle me because he really loves the show. I love the show. Then why do you interrupt it the way that you do? All those old radio shows like Jack Benny, they all had these crazy characters who'd come crashing in and everybody would laugh and, and applaud. Yes, but those things were planned. Those people were actors. They were... I know. Funny. Yes. Oh, I could be funny. But then I just see that microphone. Well, even professionals get stage fright. There's a million people listening. But it's not that. It's the opposite of that. I... I love... It's all right. Take your time. What? When I was a kid, I always had to hide in the basement. And one time I was hiding behind these boxes and I found this tape machine. It was my father's. My father was a show person. I never met him. He died. When I found that tape machine, I was just so... I started playing with it. You pretend that you're making a radio show. and no. I pretended I was on the stage, and there was an audience, and there were people listening all over the world. What exactly was your childhood like? Cleaning. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was the one who did all the cleaning in the house, and I was, you know, and so I was always supposed to be cleaning. Even when I made the radio shows, I was supposed to be cleaning. And my wait, wait, wait! You were supposed to be cleaning, and instead you'd pretend you were putting on a radio show. Yeah, I'd, I'd get in trouble. My stepfather was. Um, one thing he used to do is he'd like lift me up by the hair. Um, so he'd barge in and interrupt your show. Oh, you ruin it. The audience would go away, the, everything I was imagining would go away, and then it would just be my stepfather. So, what happened? Well, this one time I, I was um, pretending to do my radio show, and um, I was pretending I had this act on the show. And there were these bells, they were the flying bells of Toulouse, and there were these bells that just floated in from the back of the theater, and they floated all around the audience's heads, you know, in the studio audience, and they floated up by the microphone and up by the stage where I was, or well, I was imagining I was. And, and it, it was so beautiful. I didn't hear my stepfather come in, and my stepfather came in, and he hit me in the ear, and my ear started ringing. <laughs> But the ringing, well, it started bleeding, but the ringing made the bells stay. Like, normally when he came in, everything went away, but this time the ringing made the bells stay, and when the bells stayed, the audience stayed, and the whole thing stayed, and suddenly I wasn't alone. And I, and I, I always had the audience after that. No matter what I did, I'd, I'd just imagine there was an audience. I mean, I know it's not real. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But that microphone on that stage with Mr. Cameron, that audience is real. But that's just it. It 
is real. Sneaking onto that stage uninvited is no way to make people like you. Not the audience, not the sponsors, and certainly not Mr. Cameron. It's his whole life. And I'm afraid you've shortened it. I'm gonna make it up to him. I'm gonna make it up to him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean his dressing room. I'm gonna make it so nice that he'll have to forgive me. You can't sneak back in there. If they fire you, where will you go? How will you eat? I think I know a way we can get in over here. But who is this personality who cannot resist the bright lights of the stage, the beautiful shining microphones, the hypnotic pull of laughter and applause? Who is this personality who has gone so far as to imagine a narrator to keep him company announcing the events of his life as if he were the star of screen, stage, or story? God, you make me sound like such a freak. Everyone should have a narrator. Thank you, but don't go in there. Jacques-Pierre, where are you? Over here. Yeah, we're right here. Look, it's Letitia Sautier. She's cool. She's the chief stagehand. She runs the show. Look, she's not looking. Quick, before she comes. So remember, place the German Shepherds on the left side of the stage and the German Shepherd on the right or the sheep that get spooked. I know, we got it. Okay, and bend your legs when you leave the dog. I know, we got Okay, it. I know, I know, but I tell you and you don't do it. I won't have you injured. Suddenly, host John Cameron comes rushing in. Which side of the dog's on? Left, left. Right, right. Did you get rid of the janitor? He ruined the entire opening. Yeah, yeah, we got rid of the janitor. You're on, allez, allez. I am afraid of this janitor. Such a small guy. But such a large, destructive force. Why should it be so hard to keep him out? He's like he can pass through the wall. Like, we need to call the exterminator. Uh, we're still oh, here. The qua- oh, back to work! And so, having snuck into the host's dressing room, really a very terrible idea, the janitor begins cleaning furiously. I'm not furious. It's a manner of speech. Uh, but as he cleans, he hears... Coming distantly from the stage, the final musical number of the evening, which means only one thing. His favorite part of the show is about to begin. He listens and cleans quietly because each night ends with a story, a a feature presentation, a bizarre artifact, Real people telling real stories on tape. Well, you'll hear for yourself, because here comes Chief Stagehand Letitia Saltier rolling the large tape machine past. And on to the stage. The Orbiting Human Circus of the Air. What you're about to hear, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely real. There are some things in life for which words cannot prepare you. We therefore ask you to prepare yourselves for our feature presentation, Goldsby and Rue. When I was nine years old, my father died and we had to move. Mm -hmm. And my mother had to go to work. Mm -hmm. I was often alone, very often left alone in the house. And uh, it was a complete change of uh, locale, change of friends, change of teachers and everything. This was all during the war. Mm -hmm. And I even remember being in school in the playground and I remember where uh, a German Luftwaffe plane came over and he um, uh, dive bombed and machine gunned. But we all laid down in the ground and the plane came very low and all the, the bullets were going. But he obviously was deliberately missing because nobody was hurt. Uh, it's funny because I'm sort of recalling uh, now it makes me, you know, I haven't thought about it for years and years and years, but I remember that, that time now. I remember so, you know, so uh, it, it's all very vivid what happened from the first step. I noticed that my mother was being snubbed by the neighbours. And I learned it was because she was working for Goldsby and Rue, two barristers. Uh, I, I had no idea at the time what a barrister did. I had been told by other children that they had never lost a case. I realised <clears throat> they were very famous. They were famous for representing uh, rich and powerful people. And on many occasions freeing them even though they were guilty. Mm -hmm. Got new identities for them and relocated them. 
sometimes witnesses were relocated, but defendants being relocated was unheard of. The press called them Goolsby and Rule. <laughs> Ghoul, like a monster. It was really Goolsby. People were talking, uh, people were talking about my mother. Mm. I asked her why she was working for these people whom everybody thought were really, she wouldn't say a bad word about Goldsby and Rue. Mm -hmm. I was upset that she wouldn't tell me why. And uh, we always had blackouts, you know. It was dark everywhere, there were no electric lights on, all lights were out, had been blown out. And uh, and all you heard was the the bombs going off all around. I began to feel uh, lonely and sad. At this time, there was a famous trial going on about the Kensington child murders. It was announced that Goldsby and Rue was going to defend the child murderer. Goldsby and Rue were working my mother so hard I saw less and less of her. It became apparent that, that they were going to win the case on a, on a series of technicalities. The public was outraged because a child murderer was going to be set free. Every, everybody knew that he would be hidden and he would be given a new identity. After the verdict was announced, I overheard that Goldsby and Rue were going to have a celebratory dinner. And so I made a decision. That evening, I followed my mother to Goldsby and Rue's chambers. She went for her keys. She couldn't get in because I had already taken her keys. So she knocked. After my mother went in, I went up and, and tried the key and tried to get in after her. And after the door closed behind me, I suddenly realized I was in the house with the murderer. Oh, God. I was, I was scared of being discovered by either my mother or the murderer. <laughs> I can tell you it really was quite, it was quite scary. So I hid in the pantry. I stayed in there quite a while wondering what to do. At the end of the pantry, there was a light coming under the door. So I went up to the door and peeped through the keyhole. And I could, uh, and I could see how, how and where they were going to hide the child murderer. In fact, they were already uh, doing it. Uh, it's you know, there's some pretty awful things that people see. They don't want to, but you know, it just happens, and you see it. They were eating him. And I realized this, is, this must be what happened to all their clients. Uh, wasn't much fun. My mother was some other place in the building. I, I got away as fast as I could. My mother, knew, my, my, my mother never knew that I had been there. Mm -hmm. We became much closer. There was no longer uh, uh, there was no longer a gulf between us. It had dissolved, disappeared. Mm. I never told, I never repeated the story. Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the orbiting human circus of the air. Hiding behind the curtain, the janitor peers out at the show he loves. Well, that's all for this week, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Cameron, broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower. The orbiting human circus wishes you a good night.
This is Robbie Cucciar of the Orbiting Human Circus, and we'd like to thank Adam Tickets app for supporting the Orbiting Human Circus of the Air podcast. Adam Tickets app is the free mobile movie ticketing app that makes going to the movies super easy. As a big movie fan, I am very excited to be using the Adam Tickets app. You know, I don't like waiting on lines. First, you have to get your ticket, and then jump in the concession line, which can be very, very long, and I'm not a very patient man. With Adam Tickets app, that's A-T-O-M Tickets app, all those inconveniences are taken care of. I can buy my ticket, pre-order my snacks, and without paying for them, invite my buddies. Adam Tickets app also has all the trailers and reviews to browse, so I can do a little research on my movie before committing. We can just arrive at the theater, scan our QR code, and skip all the lines in a flicker of no time. Plus, best of all, you can use the Orbiting Human Circus code OHC and you'll get $5 off your entire purchases through the end of the year. That's like a free popcorn or drink every time you go. Download Adam, that's A-T-O-M, tickets for free from the Google Play or Apple App Store for the ultimate movie experience. Hello again, this is Drew Callender, and on behalf of the Orbiting Human Circus, we'd like to thank you for listening and thank our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com ohc.